gives a little more instead of just a stark okay. background. Do I look toward you? Yep, or? you're going to look okay. right out here for me. And just think, you know, about being there and... <laughs> okay. I'm going to make a you guess. All right, we'll do it again. Get untangled here. Okay, there you go, right there. And, uh, very good. Let's do it again. Right there. All right. Nice smile, Corey. There you go. Fantastic. Um, can we position our arms yeah. just a little? Just going to move this over a little bit. That's very nice. Okay, you're right in the camera, Corey. There you go. Very good. Again, right there. Very good. Come on, just turn your body. Your face. Right there. There you go. There you go. Fantastic. Right there. All right. Okay. We need to do the slides. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. You can talk to Tim or okay. the camera or whatever, but what okay. we're asking is um, why don't you stand so the light what in? we want to know fine. is You're why um, this place, why these mountains, tell us about the mountains or the land or just something about the work. Um. The mountains in the area where I work are unique. Uh, they're spectacular in their beauty, um, and they're also unique culturally um, because they are the cradle of, Amer of a human civilization that goes back oh, at least to the time before Christ. Um, so I'm very interested to know how it is that people have lived in this landscape for so long and how their customs have changed over time and I find it intriguing to uh, learn about their culture and their ways of understanding the landscape and the way they've come to learn about the mountains and the rivers that consist, uh, com comprise their landscape. Um, when you're there uh, and you're working, what are you doing? Uh, this summer what I will be doing is uh, embarking on a mapping project in the communities. I'll be using a global positioning system to um, read coordinates from satellites and uh, develop highly accurate maps of the community boundary lines and the land use patterns in the community. So my colleagues and I can um, observe how different land use patterns are related to ecological systems. Uh, Tim, you want more? That was good. Thank Turn your body in towards the box a little bit more. There okay. you go. You're going to do one more quick thing with the light back here. Okay. We're ready to fly. Get around this a little bit more. Check that out. Yeah, we're so slightly right there. Nice smile. Very good. Let's do it again. Okay, here we go again. Right out here. Fantastic. Just like that. Let's switch hats if we can. Right? That'd be a little funky, wouldn't it? Well, that's okay. That's fine. Yeah, I got it. Okay. All right. Um, I'm, I'd like to get the hat somewhere else. Just one more position. I don't 
what if we just... There, there you go. All right. Let's do, I think I got one more frame. Basically, we're looking at a shipwreck that uh, took place in 1930. Uh, means it's late in time, but it's very interesting from the point of view of the uh, development of Grand Cayman and the east end of the island. There's uh, very little lumber on the island, and uh, or lumber trees, I should say. And uh, so this uh, this particular shipwreck is a, a very mundane sort of thing. Uh, even her name is mundane. The Geneva Kathleen, um, lumber schooner out of Texas that. Uh, was intentionally wrecked on the east end of the island by a, a Comanian captain who was ready to retire and uh, brought uh, a half a million board feet of lumber to the island. And houses got built out of it and piers and uh, storage facilities and uh, the, the water tank from the ship became a cistern for a house and uh, it just um, began to help open up the east end of the island. So from that point of view uh, particularly from the point of view of the east end of Grand Cayman and the National Museum uh, of, Grand, of the Cayman Islands, this, uh, uh, this little old shipwreck from uh, 1930 is a, is a very important uh, national uh, uh, historical concern. And so we're, uh, uh, we're in the process of, uh, we spent four years there uh, excavating, well not excavating, but documenting it, video uh, measurements and uh, determining how the wreck took place and, and that sort of thing. And then uh, we're uh, putting together a book uh, for the uh, Cayman National Museum that uh, uh, they anticipate publishing in 1999. What do the students do in their participation project? We chose, um, as a part of our underwater archaeology field school, um, videoing, uh, underwater photography, that kind of thing is a, an important component of what they do. So uh, we chose uh, Grand Cayman as a place to go to practice because the clear visibility in the water and uh, we wanted a shipwreck. And um, the, the dive operation that we were working with uh, took us to this little shipwreck uh, that uh, was not very well known. And in fact, locally, people didn't know about it at all. And uh, so we started to, to do background research on it and uh, now it's developed into a full-scale project. The students do the the background research, the students do the video, the photography, uh, and it's a part of their training then uh, and in underwater archaeology and the procedures of underwater archaeology. Right there. Very good. 
All right, let me slide the box out of the way there. When you have your hand here, is there? Very good. Let's do it again. You'll give me a copy then, too. <laughs> yeah, there you go, right there. Very good. Yeah, turn your body a little bit more. Yeah, not that far. Yeah, there you go. That's good. That's perfect. Good. Okay, right there. Very good. Come on, turn the other way for me, okay? A little too far. Come back around. Right there. That's good. Oh, that's, very good. that's very nice. We'll do a couple like this. There you go. Relax just a second. That's very nice. Right there. Nice smile. Very good. We'll do it one more time. Okay. Oh, go, um, ahead. go ahead. In your project with Asia, um, what benefits do you expect Ball State and America to gain? Well, I think the <clears throat> students, faculty will have a first-hand experience to learning more about uh, China, Japan, and Korea. They will be uh, meeting uh, people in those countries and spending time and learning their culture. So they come back with living experience they can share with other students and other faculty members. And what does China, Japan, Korea gain from having a and then they will also have a direct contact with, uh, uh, they are very eager to learn not only English, but also culture, also the life of students and faculties of universities. Uh, they develop a wonderful international relationship by doing so. Um, when students go there and they come here, uh, I just meant to bring this, um, what are the most common experiences that they take back that they remember best? I think I mean, the most of the students from Ball State uh, perspectives, Ball State University students coming back and telling me, uh, reporting to, the, uh, to us that the trip has changed their philosophy of life and they appreciate more what they have here. And also, they stayed with uh, host families. Uh, so they learn and they live and they eat together with families of the Japan, Korea, and China. And uh, so whenever they come back, they always report uh, the experience they have. And then the Koreans also coming over here. We ask them to stay with our host families as well as uh, university dormitories. Uh, they have a, uh, a wonderful experience. More likely, some of those students coming back uh, to continue their studies at the Ball State University. Um, when students leave here to go back to Japan or Korea or China, um, what comments do they make about the things that surprised them in America? Particularly, I think, through our program, they thought uh, uh, Munsi is a wonderful uh, city there to visit, and people are very kind. Also, they were so surprised about uh, the scale of Ball State University. Before they came here, they thought the Ball State University very small uh, school where they don't find many things. But they, when they came and they find out Ball State University is much larger than uh, they thought, and so they like to recommend uh, Ball State University to other students in their countries. So we do have uh, uh, bring quite a few uh, students uh, from those countries. One more. Um, uh, I had this and I've lost it again. Hold on just one second. Okay. Uh, <coughs> in terms of exchanges that um, involve the economic sphere, mm -hmm. what benefits could Muncie, and, and please use that phrase so that when we cut this, people will know you're talking about benefits of the economic of the city or of the state? Well, uh, uh, particularly uh, Muncie and the Ball State, uh, we have a, uh, much economic uh, uh, benefits. When I, uh, also, we bring uh, business groups here every year. We have about 40 business people coming, and they stay here, they spend the money. And also, we have uh, many students coming here, s spending four years, two years, three years. Uh, they will also uh, uh, make a great contributions to the, to the university. Also, we do uh, uh, bring some funds to do the research in helping other programs as well. And also, in addition, I sent uh, about uh, 30 Ball State University graduates to teach English in Korea. 
they also uh, making substantial amount of uh, money as well. Okay, okay. And I've found, as I've asked people questions, that I'll say something about what do the students do with the equipment, and they'll say they. And if you could use proper nouns so people, because I'm not going to be in the video, so they need to know what you're talking about when you respond. Did that make sense? I think so. If I say, what does the puppet do, and you say, well, it. If you could say, the puppet, then okay. they'll hear it and they'll get what's going on. All right. Well, I'd like for you to do maybe is uh, kind of maybe lean in a little bit more. You can rest your hands on there. Mm -hmm. or, yeah, that's fine. We'll do a few like that. Anyway. Let's double check the lighting here. Okay. Smile there again. Fantastic. Right there. Okay, go ahead and drop the arms back down. This is kind of cropping yeah. about where her hands are. There you go, right there. Very good. Come on, move around a little more behind her for me. An elephant in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. but don't pay attention to it. That's um, fine. <laughs> okay, when you are in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. what problems do you work to resolve? Or any place? Um, I, my work in Indonesia was primarily with uh, two major educational institutions. Um, and I went there uh, primarily to help set up their women's studies programs and to teach workshops and um, courses on gender. What do you bring back with you from these experiences? Um, bring back from experiences anywhere in the world, but for me in Southeast Asia, a very different perspective um, on uh, solving problems, uh, on working with students, uh, on helping students understand that they have a perspective and that perspective influences the way they think and the way they uh, live their lives. Um, what um, when you're there and you have contact with people, what kinds of things do you bring from Ball State or from America that can affect them? I mean, not just out beyond just curing a problem. What do you present to them? And that wasn't really clear, was it? Mm. I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think about when, when they're done meeting you, right. what is it that they've gotten out of the experience in addition to the corrections to whatever problem? Well, uh, in, um, at the universities where I, where I taught, uh, there were a couple of major things I think that I accomplished. One was simply exposing them to what um, uh, academic life in the United States is like. Um, for example, one of the things that I repeatedly had to talk about um, was the fact that um, what they see on American films and TV was not really reflective of American culture. Um, that it really wasn't an accurate depiction of what Americans were really like. Um, so uh, certainly when one does this kind of work, um, you're certainly uh, acting as an ambassador in many ways uh, and representing Americans because uh, you may be the only one that they've ever met. Okay, and um, your students, what, what kind of responses do you get from your students when you bring in items like this? Um, what, is, what kind of feedback do students present based on either the, the stories you have to tell, the items you show them, 
or the perspectives that you present? Uh, American students, when I, uh, when I talk about um, my work in, in Indonesia and other places in the world, uh, the American students are often fascinated um, by the differences uh, between their lives and the lives of the, of the students that I tell them about or the people that I meet uh, in various places in the world. Uh, I think this is really very important, again, because it helps them recognize, uh, helps the students recognize that um, their experience uh, may not be shared uh, with other people, uh, whether they be students or, or otherwise citizens, of other places in the world. That culture really does have an impact on the way we think and the way we do things and the decisions that we make uh, on a daily basis. So I'm going to rotate your back now so I can see more. Yeah, that's good. All right there. Okay. That's good. Right there. Nice smile. Fantastic. Right there. So maybe go ahead and put the pencil Anyone? back in the hand, too. So you want oh. some old field notes? You want the old field yeah, notes? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead and put that one in front of you. No matter what it looks like. No. I don't know. What's yeah, it'll be pretty. I'm going to turn it just a little bit back. Where's the wall? There you go. A little bit. You can't just angle the clipboard down, just a little bit. angle it. Okay. And when I ask you a question. Uh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, in studying these flies, how does this contribute to the study of the environmental problems that you've been researching? The uh, work on the flies is directly related to the conservation effort because they're a they're a symbol of what's out there, and they're a symbol in the sense that, that people find them very interesting. And so they're a little more interested in well, what's the health of that population because those are, those are cool things. Um, but we as scientists know that they just reflect everything else that's out there in the environment. So whatever we can use to monitor the health of the environment and to get things done that need to be done so that all of the organisms there are going to benefit, then we know that's, that's good for everybody. So we sort of use the, the charismatic, the, the big tiger, the, the big rhino, in this case some antlered flies that uh, fall into that same category. So they help us monitor and, and do it in a way that people find interesting. Um, what do you bring to your students from this work? It's something specific, but you know, not, I don't mean details that will be missed by people, but what, what kind of in interest is this generated from students or what kind mm -hmm. of information you bring to students for it? Mm -hmm. Well, what this does in terms of my students is it gives them one other thing to get excited about themselves because they see my excitement about it. This is what I do. This is what I love doing. I love studying animals. And so when I tell them about my research, it's, it, I can't help but be excited about it, and that rubs off on them. And they're always intrigued by it, and they want to know more. And that leads them then to the bigger, more general questions of where does this fit into the science that we're studying in these courses. And so it's just an easy in and an exciting way to uh, approach those things for the, from the angle of the students. And what does it bring to people who are indigenous to those areas? What, how does this um, research affect them in some specific, rather than broad, ecological way? But some, is there some specific benefit to them? No, that's an easy and a tough question. Uh, in, in the tough sense, it's, it is sometimes hard for us to make the connection between 
um, how the people, indigenous peoples in developing countries benefit from basic science. Um, we, we believe they do because we believe in the long run whatever is good for the earth and wherever people live is good for them. But in a more specific sense, it's kind of easy because they're in, a, they're in quite an economic plight there. And so when scientists come in and can employ some people to help do their work, uh, that's good for them, we think, uh, as long as we're not changing their way of life in a, in a detrimental way, which we hope we're not. Uh, it's also good for them in the sense that it uh, introduces them to some of the things going on in the outside world that they might find could be beneficial to them. We are a conduit for that kind of information. And I, I think it's good for them because they learn something more about um, what, uh, what can be done on their own. In other words, what they can do to help themselves rather than just somebody bringing in aid and handing things out. They find out, hey, we might be able to make a, a going out of this by being guides for people that want to come see what we have or, or to help other scientists that might follow me. So it, uh, it's, it's a tough question. I'm not sure I can say everything about it is, is helping them, but I hope so. Some of it is. Um, in the National Geographic article, they talked about the flies uh, and described a, a variety of the antler fly, you study antler flies, what other kinds of flies do you, do you study? I mean, just a list of what you study and a little description of them. Well, in terms of that article, that is, that's the only aspect of, of the research that they covered my study with antler flies. Now, I, in other parts of this country and other countries, I study uh, insects and spiders uh, from the standpoint of their behavior, mostly their mating behavior, their, their reproductive success, uh, including things like doing DNA fingerprinting of, of uh, spiders to determine which males fathered offspring, and, and that uh, relates to things that people read about in the paper all the time. And for science, it relates to understanding better the physiology of reproduction. Um, so, so I study insects from a behavioral standpoint, including flies, wasp, um, uh, orthopterans, which people know as katydids and grasshoppers, and uh, all sorts of insects. Thank you. That went well. Thank you very much. Me. There you go. A little bit more. Right there. And I can see my backlight there, so I got to lower it. <laughs> Okay, there you go, right there. Very good. And do it a few more times. Okay. Again, bring your head a little bit more over here, and I'm going to do one quick thing. We're going to do a little bit. There you go. That's nice. Right there. Nice smile. Very good. Right there. Let's do it again. One more like that. And we'll change the pose a little bit. There you go. Right there. And there. All right, I tell you. Okay, here we go. Right there. Very nice, very nice. Let's do it again. It's easy to smile here. <laughs> okay, there you go. Right there. Very good. Hey, what? Just okay, head around towards me. Right out here. Just a little bit on you. Okay, right there you go. Very good. One more like that. That's good. Okay, right here. Very nice. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. Okay, nice smile for you again. There you go. Fantastic. Okay, right there. Go ahead and drop your hands for maybe one, maybe put one on your hip or something. Or, okay. Or, How about this? Will this be a nice Yeah. Day? Not really? Yeah, I kind of lose your hands. And I like don't, this? Just, yeah, just put one on your hip or. Okay. Or, okay, well, like, well, like this? Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Let me just grab your jacket again. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. That's that's my job no, to make sure. I'm going this morning. There's no. Um, Oh, that's good. Okay, right here for me, nice one. Fantastic.